President Trump pulled us out of the Paris Climate Accords. We're all going to die. It is the end of the world. To help confirm that, from the Colorado Springs Gazette editorial page, Wayne DeLogason, glad to have you here. Thanks. Good to be here. And someone who has played a small part in this whole thing, Amy Oliver Cook from the Independence Institute, who was also on the transition team for the EPA. Thank you for destroying Mother Earth. You are more than welcome. Just doing my part. It was good. It was good stuff. Our first, the reaction. I have never seen liberals flip out more since since Dylan turned electric. I mean, this has just been crazy. Am I? No. It's 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 the the headlines have been hysterical, <laughs> hysterical and histrionic. I mean, they are, and a whole bunch of them were exactly the same. You know, there was this one headline in the New York Daily News that everybody else had about uh, uh, Trump to planet Earth, Earth. drop dead. Right. Everybody right. used this headline. I mean, talk about packed journalism. So we are all, yeah, and, and then literally we had stories saying that this could spell the end of life on Earth. And this all as a result of backing out of a plan that if every nation actually did what they were supposed to do, which was not a possibility. We couldn't even meet these goals. And we're the fastest reduction in carbon emissions in the world. We would have seen a 0.2 tenths of a percent temperature drop over about the next 100 years. This well, is not going to uh, stop, uh, stop you know, floods and hurricanes and tornadoes from killing I, I also people. get a little confused because I, I remember in my younger days, it was Sting singing, if, if the Russians love their children too, and, and we didn't trust them, but the left trusted them, and then we have Russia interfering in, in the election, and, and now it's the left that is scared of Russia, but not when it comes to this treaty, which isn't really even a treaty, because you know, we would trust them to keep up their end of the bargain, even how, how weak it, it was. Now, you whispered into the president's ear to get this done. Oh, and yeah. I, he's, he's listening to me. No. Well, why, why from a... <laughs> By the way, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take me seriously. Why was it important to, to leave the accord? That's a, that's a good question. And actually, so while it's called an accord, if it, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a treaty. Right. This is really a treaty for all intent and purpose. It should have gone through uh, senatorial approval, ratification. It didn't. Why? Because President Obama knew he couldn't get it ratified. And they say it's non-binding. Well, you know what? It's like Geico. If you, know, what do you, do? If you make promises, if the, United, if the United States make promises, what do you do? If you're the United States, you keep them. So we and China does the same thing, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. The yeah. China. Um, so we would have been held to a standard that would have been impossible to meet, as, as Wayne had pointed out. And had, had this, had we remained in it, it would have been another you know, arrow in, in the environmental left quiver to sue the government, sue agencies, sue industry, sue everybody to meet requirements that we can't possibly meet. It was... Um, it was an insane treaty in the first place, which is why the Senate wasn't going to ratify it and why the president called it an accord so that he couldn't he wouldn't have to go through uh, Senate confirmation. But we had to pull out because otherwise we could have been bound to it. So, well, and that's the thing. Activists, it, it was supposedly non-binding, <laughs> but this yeah. is the United States. It's, Activist it's, it's judges binding, would have bound us. Yeah, it's right. binding here. Yes. It's not binding in China. Or India. Right. Yeah, or, it, right. or Russia. Or any place else, but here. It, but yeah. here, here. Where we're already reducing faster than any place on Earth. And it locked, the point about it being a treaty, and it, it's, it's funny, I remember when the left was the team of the ends don't justify the means. Mm -hmm. I remember that in TV shows. I remember Norman Lear, the ends don't justify the means because those nasty people on the right, you know, they wanted to go pass a law. Now the ends do justify the means, which is we will bind ourselves to a treaty that costs us a lot, uh, costs them nothing, uh, that takes hundreds of billions of dollars to redistribute to other countries and bind us to it, but we'll do it without a vote of the Senate, which I thought was in the Constitution. Right. Well, and if you want to talk about the left, uh, double talk and contradicting itself, we hear incessantly from 
the same people who are so in favor of this, of saving the world with, through this accord, that they care so much about uh, low-income families, low-income households, uh, poor people. And, uh, you know, that, this is why we need this, because when a tornado or a hurricane comes through, it hurts a trailer park more than it does the people who live in the big houses on a hill. So therefore, we're going to save them from hurricanes and floods. What they don't tell you is that our effort to meet this through the governor's, uh, what was it called? The uh, well, Clean Action Plan. Right. Yeah. So we had clean, clean. clean, clean power, clean job, clean air, clean jobs act. We've had three increases in uh, emissions <clears throat> reductions uh, in the past decade. And so the whole thing, the whole federal plan, the, the clean power plan was based on what we've done here in Colorado. That's what Obama based it on. What we've done here in Colorado has been devastating to low-income communities, the greatest example being Pueblo, where the median family income is $24,000 below what it is in the rest of the country, or the rest of the state. And they've been hit with uh, uh, this predatory Black Hills Energy uh, utility has raised their base rate 367% in eight years. And then they just recently got another small increase, and that's so that they can meet these environmental regulations. It's killing people. People are losing their homes, they're losing their jobs, they can't, there are 6,000 people who have shutoff notices as we speak. Yeah, come on. Now listen, I listen to NPR, and I, I religiously, and they're, they're in full on panic mode. And I need to think that those people who listen to NPR, they can handle the little increase in, um, in, in the cost of electricity. I mean, it's going to save you, our planet. If you live in Aspen or Boulder or Cherry Creek, they can raise your electric rate by 30, 40, 50 percent, and it's not going to change your lifestyle much. If you're living on $35,000 a year with kids in Pueblo, it's a, it can mean you don't keep the house. All that means is we need to tax more so we can we can we can bail out the poor for right. this. What what has been the, the cost increase in electricity? Sixty seven percent over from the last during? from uh, roughly early two thousands to two thousand fourteen. We need to update that, but we saw a sixty seven percent increase in electricity rates across all sectors. A resi and there's a little variation between residential, commercial, and industrial. But, um, but Wayne is right, and if you listen to NPR, then you know that the question that they asked me was, well, what's wrong with paying a little bit more? And to Wayne's point, yeah, okay, so Cherry Creek, Aspen, Vale, you and I can afford it. But uh, I, I always direct people to a story in the Washington Post, how to not shut down a coal-fired power plant. Meet Sharon Garcia, a woman, a single working mom with kids who's got eight hundred, who's paying eight hundred fifty dollars a month in rent, and her electricity bill is two hundred dollars. And she calls it the Washington Post described that as depression, depression era obsessiveness, with not just turning off the lights. Or, or turning off the television, but unplugging it because she cannot afford that sort of phantom seepage, but you know, from the the plug into the line, she can't afford that. And you know what? We did that to her intentionally. This state, through those environmental regulations that Wayne pointed out, we that was done to her intentionally. That is cruel and it's immoral. What I find so, and I, I listened to your interview on, on Colorado Public Radio, that, well, what's, what's wrong with, a, with paying a little bit more? This is so much farther above the rate of inflation. And I've heard public radio go on about, wait a second, we need to take over health care because health care is rising above that rate and would tell us the stories of poor people doing it. We need to do something about the cost of rent and housing because it's, it's outstripping this. And they would go find the poor people. But when it comes to this issue, the poor are, are, are not, they don't exist because apparently... Um, it's, it's okay it because well the elite above, wants it. Our increase is well above the rate of inflation and well above any increase we have seen in, in wages. So, so we are purposefully driving up the price of electricity higher than the rate of inflation and higher than the rise in wages. And but the, to and save the planet, it's all right. And, and the utilities, the publicly traded utilities, 
don't mind this. They don't care. They actually like it. They've actually helped push for this stuff. Because when they go and they build a new power plant, as they did in Pueblo to meet the, 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 the mandates, the, they go for rate increases that are chock full of executive kickbacks, uh, all sorts of goodies and rewards for the people who work for the utility. That it's, was brought out during the last hearing when, when the, to their credit, the, the Public Utilities Commission cut down to about 20% what, they, what Black Hills wanted for the latest rate hike because there was a, there was a member of the PUC who grew up in Pueblo, an attorney here in Denver, and she gutted the thing because she went through it line by line and said, this isn't part of meeting these mandates. This isn't part of me. Your executive uh, kickback isn't part of meeting these mandates. So she, you know, she, she went through it, and, and that was great because it really exposed what's going on and why they don't mind having to Except raise rates one like one thing this. on that. So that same commissioner, though, just voted to include the social cost of carbon in Excel's latest ERP, electric, ERP. Re electric resource plan. The yeah. social cost, a, a crude- good, good to be Excel. A crude, even Excel doesn't <clears throat> want, even Excel knows it's, it's extreme. But, but Francis Casilia and Jeff Ackerman both voted to include a social cost of carbon in the latest electric resource plan, yeah. which means it's coming to Black Hills next. All right, we, we, right. we've only got about a minute or so here, <laughs> but let me, let me pull it back for a second. If you're a consumer of the regular media, you've heard that this was a reasonable proposal, Paris, that every country has gone on board, even China. Is that, I, I've, I've heard people think China is a leader in this, which how do you say that with a straight face is, is hysterical. But for those people who hear how reasonable this is, how it's non-binding, how it, it's a start, um, those of you who go, this is a good thing that we're out of it. How do you explain it to somebody who's been indoctrinated by listening to NPR? Let's start here real fast. I don't have a clue. I'm not <laughs> sure you can explain it to them. It's, it, it would be like explaining away someone's religion that you don't believe in, and they do believe in it. it, is a, it you know, they, they do think the world is coming to an end, and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the facts. So I call them earth evangelicals. so that's to Wayne, <laughs> Wayne's go. point. But we are leading through technology and innovation, not through regulation. You want clean air, clean water, and affordable power, we do it through innovation and technology, not through onerous regulation. So the United States will continue to lead, but it'll be through innovation. And the way to do that is to have consumers be able to choose their own power sources, not the government, and not the utilities. Amy, thank you. Wayne, thank you. Listen for me on KHOW Radio. Check me out in the Denver Post. Tell a friend about the Independence Institute. We'll see you next week.